Poland's 34 million inhabitants, crushed, scattered, and enslaved. Tens of thousands of square miles of territory shrink before the movement of lightning armored columns. Poland and the world learned the meaning of a grim new word, Blitzkrieg. World War II began on September 1st, 1939, when Germany invaded Poland. Two days later, Britain and France declared war on Germany. On September 27, 1940, an agreement called the Triparte Pact was made. It would deem Germany, Italy, and Japan as the Axis powers. In 1940, President Roosevelt moved the American fleets from California to Pearl Harbor as a way to show American force against the Japanese expansion in the Pacific. This was seen as a threat to the Japanese. Their one solution was to attack Pearl Harbor, and they did. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, which led to the destruction of the American fleets and the deaths of around 2,400 military personnel. Roosevelt gave a speech the next day. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The speech marked the U.S. entry into World War II to fight the Japanese and support Britain and France against the Germans. While America had been building its armed services and providing some military equipment for our allies prior to Pearl Harbor, it was severely unprepared to fight a war. Businesses started to shift from making their normal products to wartime products. For some of the companies, they already did have uh, contracts with the military, uh, small time. Uh, but for a lot of them, like uh, Cervelle and Hoosier especially, they had, they were always innovating, making new, or trying out new things, so it was kind of somewhat a little bit easier for them to decide when they received the blueprints from uh, the war contracts, they were able to quickly shift over some of their uh, production to follow along with those blueprints. In fact, the military uh, actually came out and said that uh, they were astounded by how quickly some of these companies, especially uh, Cervelle, uh, was able to turn around and just by the time they received the blueprints and then start actually producing what they'd been asked to make uh, was pretty, uh, pretty rapid. In December of 1941, Republic Aviation made a prototype for one of the most effective planes to be used in World War II, the Republic P-47. During World War II, the P-47 was one of the most important planes of its time as a fighter plane and an escort plane. Republic Aviation, based in New York, constructed its first plant and delivered its first P-47 in March of 1942. The P-47 statistics included a cruising speed of 350 miles miles per hour and a maximum speed of 433 miles per hour. The P-47 had a Pratt & Whitney R2859 engine which gave the plane a horsepower of 2,430. It was considered one of the heaviest planes due to its weight of 17,500 pounds. It had a length of 36 feet 2 inches, a span of 40 feet 9 inches, and a height of 14 feet 8 inches. During missions, the P-47's weapons would be 6 or 8 50 cal machine guns and either 10 rockets or 2,500 pounds of bombs. Airplanes for airplane, it probably had as much firepower or more than anybody. It had 850 caliber guns, uh, four on each wing. At one time, they had rockets on it, three on each wing. You could carry two 500 pound bombs or a 1,000 pound bomb. It had everything you needed. In the plants, they built an average of one P-47 every 2.5 hours or 10 per day. Each unit cost about $83,000. Evansville announced on March 22, 1942 that Republic would build the plant. In September of 1942, the first P-47, nicknamed Hoosier Spirit, was made in Evansville. The plant in Evansville hired over 5,000 employees and built 6,242 P-47. They built 15 different types of P-47s at this plant. 
The plant started construction on April 7, 1942 and ended on June 1943. The first plans were being produced despite the fact the plant's construction was not finished. The one thing that the Evansville plant had changed about the original was the propeller of the P-47. In P-47 Razorbacks, a tall spine was behind the pilot, which meant the pilot couldn't see behind him. This problem also occurred for the British. They invented the first bubble canopy for their plane, the Hawker Typhon. The plant made the first bubble top P-47 prototype named XP-47K. After the success of the prototype, in the summer of 1943, the first modified P-47 was made. The bubble top also included engine refinements and the addition of dive recovery flaps. However, cutting the rear fuselage created yaw instability. To support this problem, a vertical stabilizer extension in the form of a fin was made to support the instability. It ran from the vertical stabilizer to behind the radio aerial. And the U.S. adopted that uh, bubble top canopy for the, uh, the P-51 Mustangs and, of course, uh, for the Razorbacks. And so, of course, with the, uh, the bubble top, they got a very good view. They could see behind them. Uh, which was uh, big for them knowing when an enemy aircraft uh, of course would descend down and uh, enter that kill zone right behind them there. Uh, of course uh, one of the problems with it is it's removed that stability between uh, where the pilot sits and the wing or uh, sorry the uh, the tail there uh, and later on uh, this model doesn't really show it they actually had to address that problem by creating a small uh, metal ridge between where the bubble top ended uh, roughly, and back to the wing to try to stabilize uh, that wing mount. President Roosevelt visited the Evansville plant on April 27, 1943 during his 20-state tour of defense plants. Roosevelt was accompanied with Governor Henry Stricter. It was also his first wartime visit to a fighter plane factory. It was this close to the public paper on April 30th, but didn't publish photos until much later. At the end of his tour, he awarded 10 employees Model P-47s, one being Irma Drain, who was management at the time. Several companies would assist the production of the P-47, such as Hoosier Cardinal. Hoosier Cardinal was founded in 1935 by Thomas Morton Jr. Hoosier Cardinal was the first Evansville manufacturing organization to receive orders for the fence goods. Before the war, they made modern plastic, stamping, and metal for refrigerators. During the war, starting around 1943, they made tail assemblies and domes for P-47s and hired 3,000 employees. During this time, they made around 16,000 tail assemblies. They managed to earn five year awards and the Treasury Miniman flag, making them the first plant to achieve the Treasury Miniman flag. Another company, Servo, also assisted with the P 47. Servo came to Evansville in 1926 and produced refrigerators. Servo was converted for wartime production in 1942 when they received the contract to build wings. During the war, Servo built over 6,000 wings for the P 47. At this time, Servo hired over 15,000 employees, making them the largest employer. Nearing the end of the war, the P-47 production ended in mid-August of 1945. The war ended in Europe on April 29, 1945 after the Germans surrendered. World War II in the U.S. officially ended on September 2, 1945 when the Japanese surrendered after the two atomic bombs hit Hiroshima and Nagasaki. When World War II ended, 5,934 orders to build P-47s were canceled in October of 1945 came as a shock to the people of, uh, of Evansville. Of course, you know, the war wasn't going to continue indefinitely, or at least, you know, I don't think there was very many people that hoped it would, but of course it created a pretty stable work for, uh, for a lot of people. It was a new factory, and of course a lot of people were coming into the city to uh, work on uh, these, in these war production contracts. Uh, however, of course, it was relatively sudden when the military pretty told Republic to just cease. It was typical of anybody back in World War II. The main objective was to get the thing over with and be done with it. Everybody was so happy to get back home and get out of the service that nobody talked about it. As the war ended, the people of Evansville went back to their normal lives. The legacy of the P-47 and Evansville's involvement lives on to this day.